Hi everyone, uh, my name is Carl Kitzman. I'm an attorney from Kitzman Attorneys. My practice is here in Pretoria. Um, I've been asked to assist you guys with sort of like an introductory type of lecture um, into wills and estates. Um, so thanks for joining me during these quite bizarre times. Um, unfortunately, I obviously can't see your faces and can't see what you're struggling with or, or what questions you, you have. Um, as far as I understand, uh, you, everyone will be receiving contact lectures. So what I will ask is uh, during this lecture, if you guys can take notes um, and the aim would obviously therefore be by the time we're done, I've assisted you in understanding a majority of the work and that that you are still struggling with. You've noted down whatever issues you have and you are able to address your respective lecturer on um, on those particular issues so they can assist you when it comes to the contact lectures. Um, with regards to wills and estates, uh, I've sort of divided it into four different segments, or that's the way I think it would be easiest. We'll deal with wills, we'll deal with testate succession uh, in one segment, and then intestate succession in another. And then estates, we'll have a look at theory in one uh, segment. And then on the final segment, uh, we'll look at uh, the liquidation and distribution account, which is obviously very, very important uh, for your exams um, on this subject. So let's get going. Um, we'll start with test date succession. Like I said, please take notes as we go along. Um, and yeah, we'll go through a couple of the things that is, is quite important. Um, guys, first of all, when it comes to test date succession, we're obviously referring to the drafting of a valid will. Very important that uh, test date succession is not when you have a will, but when you have a valid will, because a will can be invalid and uh, that'll become clear as we go along. Um, they speak about freedom of testation in, in South African law. Now, what does that mean? That means that we can literally draft whatever we want to when it comes to a will. There is no rules. Um, we, there's no specific obligation for us to leave any of our state to anyone in particular. It's totally up to you as an individual. Um, there is sort of exceptions along the line. I mean, when we speak of freedom of uh, testation, we are restricted in terms of illegal activities, um, immoral activities. Um, we obviously can't draft a vague will. Now, obviously what's illegal is illegal and what's vague is vague. When it comes to immoral, it's sometimes open to dispute. Um, I can perhaps give you an example of I say the will is immoral, therefore it is invalid. I'm actually saying, um, well, we can go along the lines of saying, uh, doing this by way of an example. Um, if I draft a will and I say I leave everything to X, for example, and then I create a condition, which you're perfectly allowed to do, but my condition is X can receive the estate um, on condition that he marries Y. Um, that would be regarded as immoral. Um, the reason being is now I'm controlling someone else's will and obviously forcing them to marry someone in particular. That's regarded as immoral in the law, and uh, as a result, that condition will be declared invalid. Therefore, X can just inherit um, in that regard. All right. So now we understand uh, we have freedom of testation. Let's have a look at the actual formalities of a will, which is incredibly important. I think to get going, we we need to establish who can make wills, right? So in order to draft the will, to qualify to draft the will, two things is important. You must be 16 years or older, or alternatively, or secondly, you must have the mental capacity to draft the will, right? To, whenever I say you have the mental capacity in law, we speak about to appreci uh, appreciate the nature of your acts. Um, if those two conditions are met, you're obviously able to draft the will. Uh, with regards to wills, there is a formality that that uh, the will needs to be witnessed. Um, the requirement uh, to be a lawful witness would be you need to be 14 years older and then also have the mental capacity. Um, now that that's out the way, there is strict formalities they set out for you, which you need to know, obviously. Um, if we have a look at it, it's quite basic. A will needs to be in writing. You can't have an oral will. Uh, secondly, um, the will needs to be signed by the testator. And so that's obviously the person drafting will, the person's will in particular. Guys, when I speak of signing the will, I speak of 
initializing each and every single page of the will and then signing in full on the last page. Okay. Importantly, this will need to be accompanied by witnesses. Okay. So the, the formality further states that when you sign the will, it needs to be in the presence of two competent witnesses. Okay. Uh, interestingly enough, in law, we use a basic practice that wherever I sign, if it's my will, the, the witnesses sign with me. But when it comes to a will in particular, for it to be legally valid, a witness needs to only sign the last page of a will. So it is not a required formality that they initialize every single page with you as the testator. It only needs to be the last page. Um, Guys, this is very, very important, and it goes without saying, I mean, uh, for me, the most important principle thereof is to prevent fraud. I mean, if someone turns around and says, this will is fraudulent, this is not that person's signature, how are we going to resolve that? The only way is to have a look who the witnesses were and get the witnesses to testify and say, no, this person signed the will in my presence, and I signed as a witness in that person's presence. So I confirm it was indeed that individual attended to the will. That, that's pretty much the most important part of having these witnesses as a formality. Um, we go further. Sometimes people sign by means of making a mark or some other person needs to sign on their behalf. And that could be for whatever handicap that that person has at that uh, particular stage when they're drafting the will. Um, the moment you sign by making a mark or the moment someone signs on your behalf, then a commission of oath needs to be present. And that will needs to be commissioned. And very importantly, the commissioner therefore indicates that this is indeed the will of that person and he has satisfied himself with the identity of the testator. Um, that's a very, very important formality. If you do come across a will that is signed by a mark or, like I said, someone else has signed on their behalf. Guys, when I speak about the formalities for a will, which is all those different points I just mentioned now, uh, I want you to also take note that if I wish to make an uh, amendment to a will, the same formalities apply. If I want to change something in a will, once again, I'll need to sign uh, next to it. I'll need the witnesses to sign uh, um, in the presence um, of myself and, and uh, vice versa. And if it's a mark or a um, something, Someone else is signing on your behalf, then a commission of oath needs to be present. Right. That's the formalities of a will. Very important. The, the next important thing um, that I've identified is section 2A, 2B, and 2C of the Wills Act. Let's have a little discussion on that. 2A deals with revocation of a will, to revoke a will, to cancel a will. I guess it, it's quite simple to revoke a will. As a rule of thumb, if I receive a, a will that I need to draft, the very first uh, subparagraph would be a revocation clause that simply says I revoke all previous, previous wills. Um, this just, and obviously the date of that will will be compared to any other previous wills. And if the last dated will says you revoke previous wills, it's been revoked. Um, the will can also be revoked um, through the High Court itself. Um, an example of a high court deeming a will revoked is the court might be of the opinion that this person has indeed amended their will in one or other way. Or alternatively, a will can be deemed revoked if it has been destroyed. So if the will cannot be found or whatever purpose it is, the court can deem there's a reason why it can't be found because it's been destroyed, meaning you no longer wanted it to be a will. Um, keeping in mind that there is an assumption that everyone would have wanted to to pass away leaving a will in test date succession. So if there is a will, the court will try its best to always try and interpret that specific will, um, as it is assumed that no one would have liked to have died in test date. Um, we'll come across to that uh, on the next segment. Okay, <clears throat> 2B. 2B deals with the situation of marriages. Now, it's a bit of a tricky one, but 2B speaks about a three-month period after divorce. So, let's make this practical. If you are married and then are divorced, the first three months after the date of divorce, if you pass away, okay, and 
you haven't amended your will in that time period, the law deems it that you would not want it, not have wanted your previous spouse to inherit anymore. Okay, practically, if you married, good chance your spouse is in your will. Now you divorced, good chance you probably didn't want your spouse in your will anymore. As, as it so usually is. And they're saying, if you pass away within three months after the divorce, you actually haven't had enough chance to amend your will. Therefore, unless it's specifically stated that your spouse should still inherit, your spouse will not inherit within those first three months. Okay? On the contrary, if you pass away after three months, after date of divorce, the law goes further and says, you have now had enough enough opportunity to amend your will. Therefore, if you have not taken your spouse out of your will, it is assumed that you still wanted your spouse to inherit. Okay, that is 2B. Now we speak about 2C. 2C deals in instances where people are supposed to inherit but can't inherit or refuse to inherit, whatever the purpose may be. What should happen to this specific inheritance? Now, an easy way to remember this divided sort of into two sections. Uh, if someone renounces their right to inherit, I'm saying I do not want to inherit from you for whatever purpose may be. Okay? If I renounce my right to inherit, my inheritance will go towards the surviving spouse of the deceased. Okay? The other aspect is I do not inherit because I have either predeceased or I am disqualified from inheriting. So just to Understand that if I say I'm predeceased, I've obviously died before the testator died. He just he or she has just not amended their will. Um, and if I'm disqualified, um, example is I've murdered the person who I'm supposed to inherit from. That would automatically disqualify me from inheriting. So in the case of disqualification or the case of being predeceased, what would happen to my inheritance? It would devolve per stirpes. Now, what that means is it should go upon my descendants. Okay? So if I have children, my inheritance will then go to my children. Okay. So if you renounce, it goes to the surviving spouse, but if you're disqualified or predeceased, it goes to your descendants. All right. That's section 2C, all the quite important aspects thereof. Okay. Um, cover other aspects that sort of come to mind over here is illegitimate children, children born not from a marriage can obviously inherit as equal rights. Uh, adopted children have as equal rights, but an adopted child inherits from the adopted parents. So the moment you're adopted, you no longer have a right to inherit from your natural parents. I mean, if they, if your natural parents and they will indicate that you should inherit, then obviously you can inherit. They can say what they want in their will. Um, but there's no interstate right there too. Okay, so you inherit from your adopted parents. And it's quite an interesting one. I've, I've heard this argument between colleagues and so forth. And it's come up quite a lot. And there is, it, there is scenarios that has played out where a person has been adopted and then later on in their life have actually met their natural parents and formed relationships with them. So the argument always comes up. What happens if you adopted and let's say you're 18 and you meet your natural parents and you actually start having a relationship and you start becoming part of that family as well. Okay. And you know, you meet your perhaps other brothers and sisters and you're regarded as one of the family. Anyways, 20 years later, one of the parents pass away and the parents pass away without a will. Now in such a scenario, you have no claim towards the estate. You have a claim to the estate of your, adopted parents. But the situation comes up. This is my natural parents. I've rekindled my relationship with them. I've become one of the family. Should I not have a right to inherit from the natural parents as well? And this this situation can, can really spell out of hand when you have half of your natural family saying you should. You are a child, just like everyone else, all your brothers and sisters. And the other half saying, but the law doesn't permit it. So the argument would be, can this adopted child now, or should he be allowed, he or she be allowed to inherit from the, from the adopted or from the natural parents as well? And uh, there's so many different arguments on it and so many people with different opinions. Um, uh, I mean, that's open to interpretation and I wouldn't want to get into that, but all I would 
refer to is what the law says. And we should all know that ignorance of the law was not an excuse. Meaning the person who passed away should have known um, that if there is no will and this adopt or this well prior child that I had rights to is not mentioned in my will, then this child will not be able to receive any inheritance. Okay? So the assumption is if I wanted you to inherit, I would have created a will. Because I didn't create a will, now my spouse and children considered in law as my legitimate children. Will now inherit. So that's sort of where the legal argument stands on. But I know the issue has been has been taken to court, and uh, and uh, there is no clear sort of ruling I can give you in this regard. Um, like I say, it's uh, people are still challenging it. But I think it's quite an interesting part of law, and I'd like to see what what arguments get laid there. You know, um, going forward. Nevertheless, um, as we spoke about competency to make a will earlier. We spoke about formalities. We spoke about being 16 years old and having the mental capacity to do so. What about scenarios when you are sort of disqualified from inheriting, right? So I spoke earlier about if you go and murder the person you're supposed to inherit from, you're disqualified. So in other words, they refer to that as the blameworthy killer. Right? you will be disqualified. You'll also be disqualified from inheriting if you unduly influence the, the testator. Now, we can take this further. Um, you, if you supposed to, if you're a beneficiary from a will or an heir, um, you cannot draft that will of that person or sign as a witness. That would disqualify you from inheriting. Well, that was the initial principle. So if I'm supposed to inherit from my parent, for example, and I drafted the will for them or I signed as a witness for them, that would disqualify me from inheriting. Um, but this was obviously challenged. And they said, you know, not everyone knows this. And we are lay people. I do not know that I'm now disqualified from inheriting because I assisted someone with their will. So this was challenged. And there's sort of like a finding that's come out now that if you, if you sign as a witness or draft someone's will, and you can prove or show that you did not unduly influence that person, then you may inherit, but not more than you would have received intestate. Okay? When we come to interstate law and show you how it works, then you'll see what a disadvantage that still can be. You know, uh, At least you can still inherit, but like I said, not more than you would have done had it been in interstate succession. Okay. That's another aspect that um, needs to be noted is pension funds and retirement annuities does not form part of your will. And those who do have pension funds, retirement annuities will note when you opened that particular annuity, you needed to choose a beneficiary. So what should happen to that funds should you pass away? And that particular annuity or pension fund will be paid out to the person mentioned um, when you open the, when you open that fund, okay. All right, another aspect: joint wills and massing. Okay, so joint will: two or more people um, draft a will together. That's nice and basic. Um, what is massing though? Um, massing also deals with 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 two people that that has a will together. But there's certain rules that come into place that we need to sort of understand here. Massing can be quite a negative thing, and it can disadvantage you, uh, disadvantage you quite a lot. Massing has the implication that, let's say I married myself and my spouse, we now decide we're going to mass our states. Okay, the states will become one. If I pass away or she pass away, by the death of the first dying between us, the estate will now devolve to the particular beneficiary. Now, let's think practically about this. I'm, for argument's sake, 35, and I've got a master state with my spouse, and I'm in a car accident and pass away. My spouse is in her 30s as well. Now, all of a sudden, our whole estate must go towards, let's say we chose our child as the beneficiary. Our whole estate must go to the child. And, you know, she's got a lot of life left in her. So 
it's going to be quite a negative effect to her. So, so that's why there's a couple of rules when it comes to massing. First of all, if we mass in a state, if one of us pass away, the surviving spouse can choose to adiate or to repudiate. If they choose to, to adiate, they say, I accept the massing, please continue with it. On the other hand, they might, they might say, I repudiate, meaning I no longer want to do this massing. It's just not going to work out anymore. Um, then you can repudiate and you do not need to continue with the massing. However, you won't be entitled to a claim from your spouse's estate. Then. That's the negative thing from choosing to repudiate the massing. But let's say you adiate. There is a rule when it comes to massing. And the rule is if we leave, if we mass our estates and we leave our estate to our a beneficiary, whoever that may be, I'm just calling it our child for, uh, for practical reasons, then there needs to be some form of interest left for the surviving spouse. Okay, so let's make that practical. Let's say I leave, we leave our immovable property must I go to a beneficiary because I pass away. My spouse needs to have some form of right or interest to that immovable property even though the property is the, the beneficiary's property now. Now, what's an example of, a, of an interest there? And it could be a habitat share of the property, meaning my spouse, even though the property will go to my child, my surviving spouse still has the right to live in that property. That's an example of interest. Another one might be a fideicomism. Okay? Speaking about fideicomism, we need to understand what that is as well. Now, fideicomism is when I take an an asset and I leave it for someone, let's call that person X. But I say upon X's death or upon whatever condition I set out, the property must go to Y. Okay. So it's when you leave an estate to two people, okay? but the first one who receives it doesn't become the owner of that property. The first one gets to use and enjoy that property. But when they pass away or whatever the condition was, it must go to the second person. And that second person would then become the owner. Practical reason, I leave my estate to my, to my daughter, and I say, when she passes away, it must go to her daughter. Great. So my granddaughter would thus be the owner of that property, but my daughter can first use it. Okay? So that would be another example of an interest in massing. I say, I create a fideicomism. My spouse can stay in that property. It goes to her. But when she passes or whatever reason, whatever the condition was, it must go to the beneficiary. So the beneficiary becomes the owner of the estate with massing, but some interest is left to the surviving spouse. Great. I hope that sort of clarifies any issues you might have with that aspect. Um, guys, an, uh, another thing that's quite important is the issue of maintenance, um, which obviously practically comes into effect quite a lot when you have people passing away, but there's maintenance claims that could be instituted by the surviving spouse and importantly by any minor children. Um, this needs to be instituted against the estate. Now you would need to know the different factors one considers when deciding or when the court decides how much maintenance the, the surviving spouse or children a claim from the deceased estate. What factors would they consider? Well, first and most importantly, we'd consider how much money is actually in the estate. What's the size of the estate? That'll obviously determine what your maintenance claim can be. But other factors, what was the financial capacity? You know, obviously an estate of 10 million is going to be a, a higher maintenance claim than an estate of 500,000 rand. Other factors, what was the standard of living um, that... Uh, that the, the family had at that stage. I mean, when you speak about a spouse in particular, if she wants to claim maintenance or he wants to claim maintenance, you'd also have to consider their age. I mean, someone who's young can still go get a job and work, and they might not have the same maintenance claim as someone who's a pensioner, um, on the other hand. So there's all these different factors. I mean, even subsistence of the marriage plays a part. I mean, the longer you were married, the more entitled you could be to a, a maintenance claim. And all these things need to be taken into account um, when devolving an estate at the end of the day. Right. As with regards to the actual drafting of a will, we've 
we've mentioned earlier freedom of dissertation, meaning there is no actual right or wrong way to draft your will. You can draft it in any other way. I believe it's very important that you understand the different subheadings that can come into a will. And the way you write what should happen underneath there is, like I said, no right or wrong. But you need to be able to advise your client what things automatically take place when you dra draft the will, what options they do have when drafting a will, because they will not know all these things. So I don't want to go through different subheadings you can you get when drafting a will, because that is in your books, um, everything. I would like to just discuss one or two aspects um, thereof, just to make sure we all understand it. Um, uh, very clearly. We spoke earlier about a revocation clause and I, I told you guys that's very important to draft your will to start off with a revocation clause. Just saying I revoke all previous wills just in case there is previous wills. But that is if the client wants to revoke previous wills. Um, that's sort of a formality that I put down. Another issue that comes to mind when drafting a will is what we refer to as collation. Now collation is something that automatically applies, meaning if we don't say anything about collation, this will apply to this person's estate. And a lot of people don't actually want it to apply. So collation means that you would have, your direct descendants, your children in other words, there's an assumption you would have wanted to make sure that they all receive inheritance equally, right? That they all should have benefited in equal amounts. So what that means is, Let's make another practical scenario. Let's say I have a child that's 18 and a child that's 16. Now, I told both my children, when you're 18, I'll buy you a car. Cool. So the one that's 18, I've purchased a car. Let's say it's worth 100,000. Now, I'll pass away. As I pass away, the one that's 18 received a vehicle of 100,000 rand. The one that's 16 had received nothing. Meaning, when my state devolves upon them, uh, I should first take the value of the vehicle being 100,000 Rand and give that 100,000 Rand to the 16 year old and then divide everything 50 50. Like I said, the assumption everyone should receive equal amounts. Now that sounds all good and well, but practically speaking, this can create an issue because you have the scenario of, but this person got this and that person got that and it can become a nightmare. The, the biggest issue we have when it comes to wills and estates is the family feuds that come into play afterwards and the claim that people want to money, et cetera, et cetera. So we always try to draft something that will prevent sort of any arguments and collation can lead to arguments. A good way to sit down and drafting laws to think, right, what can these beneficiaries, what can these legatees, these heirs, what can they possibly fight about? And I start thinking of all the different things that could become an issue and we clarify that in the world. Therefore, there can be no arguments that are open to interpretation. What the will says is what the will says. There's no two ways around it. Okay, so collation is one aspect. Like I said, it applies automatically, so you don't need to mention it. But if your client chooses not to do collation, then you're going to have to say collation will not apply. And you can put that under a subheading in your will as well. Um, which is very important you explain that to your client because 10 to 1, they, they will not know that. Obviously, guys, we have legatees and heirs. As just to clarify, a legatee or legacy is someone who receives a direct, a specific inheritance. So if I say I leave my car to X, X is a legatee because I'm giving X something specific. If I say I'm giving 100,000 Rand to X, X is a legatee because I'm giving something specific to them. Right? So you can have legatees in your world. And you specify, this person must get this, this person must get that, right? Then you can also have heirs. Now, heirs is people who receive the remainder of your estate. Okay, so I can say X receives 100K, Y receives the car, and Z is my heir. Z receives what's left of the estate goes to Z. Okay. When devolving a will, legacies are ranked above heirs. So the legacy must first get what they're entitled to, what the will said, and then the remainder goes towards the heirs. Right. Um, third icomisms, we spoke about, about that. We understand the passing over to two different um, beneficiaries in that regard, the second one becoming the actual owner thereof. Usufrux is another aspect that I'm quite worried about uh, 
very skeptical about because people don't seem to always understand the actual consequence of the use of fruct. So I'm sure you guys have heard the term before, you should have heard the term before. But a use of fruct refers to someone is entitled to enjoy the fruits to a property, meaning the rights to something specific. So I have this um, farm, for example, and I make X the owner of the farm. It is X's farm. But I give Y a use of the fruct over the farm, meaning I'm giving Y the right to use the farm. So let's say business. Y wants to put cattle on the farm. Y can do that. X can't stop it. Y can use the farm to make money, in other words. That's a use of fruct. But we, we need to be very careful to understand what the, the consequences of it. The, the right of a use of fruct holder is exceptionally, exceptionally strong. So Y can use that farm exactly how he or she wants to. There is no restrictions. The owner of the farm, being X in my example, can't tell Y what to do. Y tell X what to do. I'm within my cattle there, your cattle's got to go, in other words. So you have complete control of the scenario. And usually, if not specified, specified otherwise, a use of fruit will last a lifetime. And even though X is the owner, X literally can't do anything with that property. Um, as long as Y has a use of fruit. X can't sell the property without Y's consent. X can't do anything. So the moment you give someone a use of fruit, you give them a very, very strong right and you limit the owner of the property considerably. Something to think about if you guys do go on drafting use of fruit clauses um, for your particular clients. Make sure they understand that. Right? Guys, there's a a whole bunch of other terms, guardianship, all those different things that uh, goes without saying. Something I do want to mention is a, a, a testamentary trust. Um, when it comes to drafting a will, you need to take a lot of consideration if there's children involved. What would happen if we pass away? Um, or if I pass away from a single parent, or me and, me and my spouse is in an accident, there's children left. Um, I mean, obviously, if, they, if they're minors, they can't control money and they, they wouldn't know what to do. So we need to figure out a way to make sure our children are protected. So we can draft a testamentary trust. Now, guys, when you're drafting a will, like I said, you have your different clauses. You have the executors, um, who's ever going to be winding up the estate. It's one of us, whoever gets the clients at the end of the day. And, you know, you have your collation, your revocation, your heirs, your legacies. But you can also have a testamentary trust clause. And this is of vital importance if you have to. Now, the effects there is, is that you would choose three trustees, three people to control your assets and money um, if you have passed on. And they need to control it for the benefit of your beneficiary, of your children at the end of the day, until the children are of an age to receive the inheritance, okay? which is vitally important. So you select these three trustees, up to you how you want to and they need to manage the estate, which is important. I mean, they need to manage to make sure the children get through school. So the funds from the estate, what they can, need to help to get the children through school. Maybe the children want to go to varsity after school. Go to varsity, are they staying there? They're in res, the books, all those things cost money. You're going to need to try and pay for that from the estate if the estate has enough you know, assets they're in. But one needs to also remember that you need to direct these trustees into how to manage the estate. That is why you can have testament trust clauses that are 10 pages long in a will. Um, and it's very important to be quite specific. Let's think practically about it. Let's say I have four different properties. Now, instead of just leaving those four properties in a trust, I'm thinking that properties can create income for my children. Okay. So I direct there. these properties the, the trustees have the consent to take what they need from the estate in order to upkeep the property. They have the right to lease these uh, four properties out. I mean, if you lease four properties, let's say 5,000 rand a property, it's 20,000 rand a month that the trust is making. And over the course of 10 years, I mean, you're looking at 240 times 10, you're looking at 2.4 million. My math might be off, but I'm thinking it's 2.4 million. Um, that you would, the trust or the estate would have generated just from those four properties. Now, what is that, that money going to be used for? It's going to be used to put the children through varsity. Whatever is left is going to be given to the children. So you need to indicate guidelines on what these trustees can do 
with your estate in order to maximize the estate and to give as much as possible to the uh, to the beneficiaries to your children or testamentary trust. You also need to indicate when that trust is terminated. So will the trust be terminated upon my children reaching majority, being 18 years of age? Other people like to specify, no, when the children are 25 or 30, then they can receive the inheritance from the trust, you know, thinking, you know, they're obviously a bit more mature at that stage or financially understand how their life works and won't hopefully just blow the money. You know, that's completely up to you, uh, how you want to specify these things. Um, so, yeah, the testamentary trust is, is crucial. And uh, have a look at it. And it wouldn't hurt Googling examples of it for practical reasons going forward, how to draft it and important factors to consider um, in that regard. Guys, that, that's a couple of important sort of um, terms from a will that I've identified. One last thing when it comes to test date succession, when it comes to the drafting of a will, we spoke about a, a will can be modified as well. Um, or amended was the word, rather, sorry. Um, now, you can also do what is referred to as a codicil. Now, that's an additional will where you actually amend something. So let's say clause 7 of my will read 100,000 to X, 100,000 to Y, 100,000 to Z. Now I'm happy with my whole will, but years later, I think that clause seven that gave them each 100,000 rand, I would like to actually make that 200,000 rand. So what I do is I do a codicil that gets attached to that will, saying I amend clause seven and that read 100,000 to each to now say 200,000 to each. That gets dated and attached to the will, so we know clause seven from the original will has now been amended, is what the codicil is saying, which is an, another option uh, when you're, if you're, client, let's say you're the executor uh, of an estate, if later on they wish to amend something, the whole will need not be amended. Sections can be amended by doing the codicil. Guys, uh, that's sort of an introduction into testate succession. Um, we'll, we'll then move on and have a look at intestate succession. Right.